Okay, welcome. We're going to talk about an introduction to a, to a Pong program and quite a few things in here that may be of interest to many of you, um, and most significantly including animations. So let's just take a look at what we have here in uh, play mode. Not much to this game at all. Uh, the ball moves slow. It doesn't change directions if we hit off the side. If the ball goes off the play field, it resets to the middle of the board. Um, it, as it turns out, I've, I've programmed this for spacebar to start the ball back in play. Uh, it doesn't keep score. It's just a shell or a little skeleton of what a Pong game could, could become. Um, so we're going to get right into this and talk about what's making this stuff happen. And uh, typically what we do in this course is if you finish Chapter 6 in a timely manner, that would be in the first nine weeks of the course, um, we give you what I would just refer to as a Pong vacation, and you can ex experiment around with this program for a while. It might kind of get your juices flowing on what you'd like to do for a project for this course. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look. All right, on the, on the play field, I have a left paddle shape, good name for that, a right paddle shape, and a ball, and that's pretty much it. But what you might notice down here at the bottom are each of these timers. I have a timer that controls the left paddle's movement upwards, its movement downwards, likewise for the right paddle, and I have a timer for the for the ball itself. This is going to be the biggie, the ball timer. There's a lot going on with that. But let's go ahead and take a look into the, the guts of this program. So in this program, um, I've dimensioned, and you can, the, the book would normally call this a private. I don't believe there's any difference between dimensioning outside here. These values, we want them to, we want the ball left integer and ball top integer to maintain their values throughout the program, so they're dimensioned out here. Um, what they are, and you'll see in our form load, they're just values. And the ball, if we go back to the form for a moment, the ball doesn't really move diagonally it really moves over and up and over and up and over and up and over and up and um, a lot like if you had kind of uh, like in, a, in, in the old cartoons when they have the little flip books and you'd flip through the pages of a book um, if you flip through it quickly enough it would look like the little stick figure was actually moving if that makes sense to you so that's what's going on with this and I've just pre-declared that our ball left integer is three and our ball left in and, and our ball top integer is five for instance if I took the ball left integer let's say I turn that to six that's going to give a bigger horizontal component to the movement of the ball then and it'll it'll flatten out the path and speed it up as well so let's take a look what happens with that So you can see ball's moving much quicker and at a much flatter angle. So that's something you may want to think about as you're running the program. The we don't we can be changing the speed of the ball throughout the play of the program. But for right now, I'm just going to put it back to three and three, and that's the, that's how you'll receive it in the package of the 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 file that you are given. Okay, so in uh, form one key down. Now, Form 1 has a whole lot of events to it. Um, this is just our form. All these different events we can, we can deal with. In it. And what I wanted to know is what, ha is I want to know what key am I pressing down at any given time. And I've got these E key values. This little message box I have, and there, there are other ways of doing this, but, uh, but this is the way that I've, I've done this. If I take this, the comment off of this message box, and let's say I wanted to put a, a pause feature in this program. Um, so when I go to run this thing, what I'd be interested in seeing what happens is is I, I want to know what number is associated to the to the key P. So I'm going to hit P on the keyboard in three, two, one, and P is an 80. Now my space bar I, I mentioned earlier is what puts the ball in play. I'm going to hit space bar in three, two, one. Space bar is 32, and you see the ball goes in play after that message box disappears. I want to make sure I don't hit this on that, that end. There we go. Okay, so th that's how I would capture what the keys are, what the different keys are. So I use that just to figure out what my key codes are. Um, for instance, I'm using A to have my left paddle move upward. I'm using Z on the keyboard to have my left paddle move down. I'm using 
actually using quotations over by the enter key for my right paddle to move up and then the slash for my right paddle to move to move down just kind of kind of convenient places and and kind of makes kind of makes sense as far as their their placement on there so we'll talk about this left paddle timer and this uh, uh, the right paddle timers uh, momentarily okay if the if the, the e that's this guy up here not too important that we know what that is if its key value is 32 though I mentioned that's the space bar and if we go back into play mode you will notice if I this one went up and to the right this one went down and to the left and this is just random this one went up and it's not going through any sequence see we went back up right before we went down left we still haven't gone down left and we still haven't gone down left but trust me down left is just as likely as the others it just doesn't appear so at this moment okay so how does that work well visual basic you're going to see this randomized statement and x equals rnd x is going to be a random number visual basic does not really create uh, random numbers but but there's a big long uh, list of random numbers decimals between 0 and 1 and all randomize does is it throws you somewhere into that list and so we're just saying jump into that list somewhere and then x which is a des which is a decimal takes the value of one of those random numbers so x is a number between 0 and 1 and then i say if x is less than 0 0.5 well x should be less than 0 0.5 half the time then my ball integer left how far i'm moving left equals negative 1 times how far i used to move left uh, so now we might be moving right or if it was right then we're moving left i just chose left you'll see why sh shortly uh, for the for the name that doesn't necessarily mean it's moving left that's just its horizontal component this just changes the direction of our horizontal component component then I grab another random number and I do the same for my vertical component ball top integer if it's less than 0.5 then I change the direction of it if it was moving up at the end of the last point it's now moving down vice versa and then I enable the ball timer okay let's go back up and take a look at uh, at this at this key a if we go back into run mode if I press a now my paddle moves up I'm gonna press Z back down now if I press a and lift a press lift press lift it, it uh, stops also if I press a and keep holding it and I'm still holding it now somehow or another it knew to ignore and not move up any higher um, it, it could have just moved right off the screen we had to control that programmatically so let's take a look at that if the key value is 65 or if I pressed the a key then I'm gonna let left paddle up timer enabled property be true well we better go take a look at uh, left timer up paddle the left paddle or left paddle up timer there aren't too many properties for for uh, timers and really there's only a couple truthfully that in my in my eyes really matter whether or not it's enabled true or false and it's interval what its interval is its interval is how many milliseconds pass between times when we we do this again a timer is like having a button that you just hit continually now if I started this I'm gonna move this guy down a little bit if I started my left paddle timer up in true and I start the program my hands are off the keyboard right now it's pretty annoying that's why I started in, in false so I set this guy to false and then later on I tell it to be true so two milliseconds or or basically 500 times a second this thing is trying to move this paddle is trying to move and the paddle doesn't truthfully move steady like this it really moves it's like the top moves up a little bit then the bottom moves up a little bit it's kind of like a little inchworm deal but I'm going to control Z and get back to where I was there so it's like the, the top moves up the bottom moves up the top moves up the bottom moves up but because it's happening so quickly it fools our eye into thinking that it's just a continuous smooth movement okay so we'll go back into code and let's take a look at that so once this timer is enabled the code associated with the timer is right here so left paddle timer one tick so it's like a clock ticking but it's basically like clicking the button repeatedly over and over first thing I do is I 
ask is the left paddle timer shapes Y1 property. Well, better look at this. The paddle has a X1, X2, Y1, Y2 property. You're going to see, I'm going to release this. Watch, watch the bottom right-hand corner in the properties. I'm going to release it in three, two, one. And all of those change. For instance, if I take this top one here and I release it in three, two, one, that's going to change the Y1 and the X1. Three, two, one. Okay. So those are what we're going to affect. If I want to, if I just drag this up, if I can keep it vertical straight above, all that should change now is the Y1 property. Three, two, one. And it changed. The X1 changed a little bit. I didn't have it perfectly vertical. Okay, so we'll go back into code. And so what I want to do, I want to know if the, the left paddle shapes Y1 is less than 1. Now, if you notice back here, the higher this paddle gets, uh, oop, can't, can't see it right now. Let's go down here. Watch the Y1 property. When, when I put this up, up top here, I'm going to put it clear up in this position. Watch the Y1 property in 3, 2, 1. It's now negative 43. It's now right where at the point where I'd pretty much want it to, to stop moving up. So right at about negative one, one, zero, basically right at around, come here, right around zero is where I want that to stop moving up. So we go back into our code and we say, if left paddle, if left paddle line shape Y1 is less than one, basically, are we at the top? We're just testing, are we at the top? If we are, then I'm just gonna shut this timer down. Then left paddle timer up enabled equals false. That's why it stops when we move up. Otherwise, remember what I said, it, the, the top moves up five. Now this is kind of weird. I'm subtracting five to move up. That's not what we learned in algebra, but a, a form always has a top and then we move the bottom down. So um, zero is at the top, the biggest number is at the bottom of the form. Then I'm basically moving the bottom of the, the paddle up right here. And everything else works pretty similar to that. Right paddle down, for instance, is just like that, except here we're testing the bottom of the paddle. And the big question should be this plus 44. The bottom of the paddle, uh, it doesn't quite conform with the bottom of the form. And I had to play around with 44 to make it look like, let's run. I'm going to move right paddle down now in three, two, one. It looks like it stops at the right spot. And that 44 was just a buffer to make it look like that, ha that, that works right. So this basically says if right paddle down, the bottom of right paddle is bigger than the height of the form. That's me, the form's height. Then I'm shutting it down. Otherwise, I'm adding five to it. So we're just going five down with the top and the bottom. That's what moves the paddles. So that's the that's the easier timer. The tougher timers, so all these paddle timers are, are basically the same. The ball timer is a pretty big deal. Um, one easy thing, and I've got this commented pretty well for you. Um, looks like I'm not using this guy. I think I did that for, for another feature. So this is fairly easy here. Uh, the ball shape does not have does not have a Y1, X1 property. The ball shape has, as far as its location, has a top and has a left property. Um, it also has a width property. It also has a height property. Some things that we can, so you see here, we've got a width property, a height property. We could deal with its location. It does have an X property and a Y property, but that's basically the left of the ball, the top of the ball. I'm gonna use the top property and its left property along with its width and height. And you'll see what I'm doing with that, hopefully. Okay, so if ball shape top, if the top of the ball is less than one, then the ball has moved to a point where it's on the top of the paddle. And what should happen then, if the ball is moving left, it should continue left, but if it was moving up, it should now move the opposite of up, obviously down. So this is pretty simple. If ball shape dot top is less than one, we've hit the top of the paddle, top of the board and I just changed the, its top which again is its vertical component what was up becomes the opposite of up okay now a little bit trickier to see if it hits the bottom to see if it hits the bottom I don't want to know when the top hits the bottom 
I want to know when, when the top of the ball hits the bottom of the form. I want to know when the bottom of the ball hits the bottom of the form. Okay? So I have to add on the height of the ball. So we'll go back in. So I check if ball shape top plus ball shape height, that basically right here gets us to the bottom of the ball. And there's that little plus 44 buffer that I used on the paddles up above. If that's greater than the height of the form, than what used to be going down, I want my vertical component to change. Okay. Well, when does my horizontal com component change? My horizontal component should change when I hit a paddle. And that is by far the trickiest part of this program, and that's called collision detection. And that's a big part of just about any game, that, that uh, any kind of action game that you'd want to look at. So when does it, when does it hit the paddle? Well, I have to have, follow this if you would, the top of the ball has to be above the bottom of the paddle, otherwise it goes underneath. Top of the ball has to be above the bottom of the paddle. The bottom of the ball has to be below the top of the paddle. And I wouldn't want it to bounce right here just because the top of the ball is above the bottom of the paddle and the bottom of the ball is below the top of the paddle. It also has to be in vertical line with the paddle. So in vertical line, above the bottom, and below the top. So you're going to notice we have three if statements in this. So let's take a look. Here is, does it hit... I'm going to go with the left paddle first. I just illustrated the right paddle. And this is a tricky little sucker here. So pay attention to this one. After this, it's a little bit more straightforward. You would probably be able to guess what math.abs does. That's our absolute value. In order to know if, if I'm in vertical line with, the tricky part here is, yikes, the tricky part here is, I may never be exactly in vertical line. I'm moving by horizontal increments of three. I may be two to the left of it and then one to the right of it. What I need to know is if they're close. And numbers are close if the subtraction of the two numbers is small. So here's what I did. I'm going to take the absolute value. I don't want to deal with negatives. I'm going to take, and this is, this is hitting the left paddle, so I should illustrate that. I need the left of the paddle to be close to this guy's x property, either one of its x properties. They're 72, 73. They ought to be the same right now. But Okay, so I go into here, and I math absolute value. I take the balls, control Z. I take the ball shape's left property, the left of the ball. I subtract that from the left paddle's x property. And I say, if that is smaller than the absolute value, because see, ball timer left integer could be a negative. This guy could be negative. If, if I take that 3 that I'm moving, divide it by 2, and add 1, that's a little bit more than half, half of the ball. That's a little bit more than half of how far I'm moving, excuse me. So I'm going to be within that range at some point. In other words, if I'm moving by, let's say I'm moving by increments of 8 to the left. I get 8 divided by 2, 4, plus 1, 5. I'm going to be within 5 on one side of the paddle or the other when I move by 8. So I'm testing, am I basically in vertical line width right here? Okay, then I want to know if ball shape's top is less than, less far down than left paddle's Y2. That is the bottom of the paddle. That's testing, okay, first off, I'm in line with. That's testing, is the top of the ball above the bottom of the paddle, paddle is the top of the ball above the bottom of the paddle. So this is the top of the ball, less than would place it above, and the bottom of the paddle is its Y2. And now I have to check, is the bottom of the ball, so I take the ball's top because there's not a dot bottom pro property, plus its height, that gets me to the bottom ball, is that further down than the paddles top. And if so, what do I want to change? What used to be left now becomes right. Okay, very, very similar to the for, for the paddle on the right. You will notice though, we got a little bit of a difference in here than what we had there. And it'd be a great time to pause this video and give some thought why to hit the right paddle is this 
where just that was. So if you want to pause, think about that. I'm going to give you the answer right when you come back. So pause now. Okay, this ball shape left plus ball shape width gets me the right side of the ball. I want to know when the right side, did it again. I want to know when the right side of the ball, not the left side of the ball. I don't want it to look like it comes underneath here. Watch what happens if I go ahead and take this statement. I'm going to take this guy, copy it, put it under here, paste it, and comment this guy out. And let's, let's say I didn't have that statement in there. And let's look what happens when it hits the paddle on the right. So watch closely. See how it looks like it goes through the paddle a little bit, kind of like slingshots or trampolines out of there. One more time here. That's because I'm waiting for the left side of the ball to hit the paddle, and I want the right side of the ball to hit the paddle. So let's clean that up. And now you'll see it gets the desired effect. Looks like it hits cleanly off the right side of the ball. Okay, all that's left is what do we do when the ball goes off the screen? So, so that's our that's our paddle work. Um, here, actually, before we go off the screen, this is this is all it takes to move the ball. So the the tough part is our collisions. Well, ball shape left. If ball shape ball shape left equals ball shape left plus ball left integer. Now we all know that we could write that as ball shape left plus equals ball left integer. Could be written that way just as well. I kind of like that for brevity, but I kind of like this for explanation. The ball is going to be where the ball was plus our ball left integer, which could be a negative, so we're moving right or left. Same with the top. Okay, off the screen. In here is where you would probably, first thing, first job would probably be to add scoring. I just said this, if ball shape left is greater than the width, or ball shape left is less than zero, then we have either exited off the screen to the right or exited off the screen to the left. In there, you'd need to distinguish to know who scored the point. But all I did is I took the ball shape and I put it halfway through the width. It's it put its left property halfway through the width. I put the top of the ball halfway through the height of the form, and then I turned the timer off. So now the timer is awaiting for 32 or the space bar to be hit again. Now some things you could look at here is it might truthfully, I'm going I'm, I'm to change these guys to decimal. Even though they're still named integer, that's probably bad coding for them, but for the, in the interest of time, I'm going to do this. And now what I'm going to do is every time it hits a right paddle, uh, so did we hit the right paddle? I'm going to take ball left integer times equals 1.05. And let's see if we notice what's happening with that. Ball left integer should be increasing by 5% every time it hits the paddle to the right. This may be subtle, um, but let's take a look as we run. So notice speed of ball, notice kind of the angle of trajectory here. It's only going to change when we hit the right. You may never notice in one click, but pretty soon you're going to notice this guy flattening out, speeding up a little bit. Doesn't seem like much. And to be honest, for game, game playing, see, you can start to tell it's picking up pace and it's going at a flatter because I didn't change ball top integer. Um, for gameplay, you probably don't even want to start this at three because it's just no challenge whatsoever. But there's all sorts of things you could do. You could mess with somebody's, um, the width of their paddles. You could introduce an additional ball. There's lots of different possibilities, and we'd be happy to help you with those. But I think you get the point here. This is most definitely flattening out. And the one thing you'd want to consider here, and you can certainly tell the speed's picking up now, and that is kind of a geometric progress, or a, excuse me, an exponential prog progression. So it starts to become more and more noticeable as we go. Now, the challenge with this would be, let's say, okay, it got to a speed where I couldn't keep up. Now when we go to put it in play, well, it's, it starts right at the speed it left off at. 
So you'd want to probably do something like, for instance, when the ball goes out of play, you might want to take the initial speed components right here and put those in when the ball goes off play, something like that, so you're back to your original speed. But anyway, that gives you a that gives you something you can work with quite a bit. Um, no idea. Uh, you may come up with some ideas that we think may be too challenging to implement, but uh, but it's certainly worth discussing. If you got an idea of what might make this game a better game after you put in the scoring and maybe play around with the ball speed, um, by all means, uh, ask anyone around who, who who may be able to lend lend you help or ask me. Um, we're happy to do so. I uh, hope you enjoy this. Hope this triggers some ideas for some games for you moving forward. And good luck with this.